So I did some voodoo magic with these numbers and came out with a solution that worked. So I'm going to show you how to do this voodoo magic with linear algebra and matrices. So the first thing we're going to look at is the correspondence between a system of linear equations and, an, and a matrix. So this is going to be the correspondence. So we'll do three equations, three unknowns. All right, so this <coughs> right here is the linear equation. The variables are x1, x2, x3, and the coefficients are a11, a12, a13. Our second, we'll go a21, x1, plus a22, x2, plus a23, x3, equals b2. So that's our second equation, our third equation. Hopefully I have all these subscripts right. a33, x3, equals b3. All right, all we're going to do to turn this into a matrix is ignore the plus signs, ignore the variables, and ignore the equal signs. So I'm just going to highlight the elements that will make it into our matrix. It's basically all the coefficients that there are, and including the constant ones on the right side. So it's the three coefficients on the left and the constant on the right. And the matrix this turns into A11, A12, A13, B1, A21, A22, A23, B2, and A31, A32, A33, B3. Now the only reason this looks tricky is because subscripts are hard to work with. They basically suck. They're hard to write, hard to work with, and somewhat confusing. But literally I just took the first upper left elements, the upper left element. The next one to the right is the next one to the right. So you're just copying these numbers I have highlighted and putting them in a matrix the exact same order that they're in. So let's do, for practice, I'll just write down a system and then you're going to write down the matrix. Uh, and this is called the augmented matrix, also known as the coefficient matrix. And coefficient matrix is a good name because it's all the coefficients are inside of a matrix. All right, so we're going to write this system as an augmented matrix. I think the word augmented is used when you drop a line down to separate your uh, variable coefficients from your constant coefficients. So the augmented matrix, the idea of you're just kind of keeping track of here's our constants, here's our coefficients. So we'll do 3x minus z equals 4, negative x minus 2y plus 3z equals 1, and last up Do y, 7y uh, minus z equals negative 2. All right, I want you to write the augmented matrix down. How many rows should be in your matrix? Three, three. three rows. What about columns? Four. There should be four. So there needs to be 12 elements, 
but not every coefficient is written down. Some coefficients are zero, so make sure you space it out correctly. Uh, 3, 0, negative 1, 4, and negative 1, negative 2, 3, 1, and 0, 7, negative 1, negative 2. So I will never intentionally change the order of variables. So for example, the last equation could be written as negative z plus 7y equals negative 2. You can change the order, but putting it into a matrix takes a little more work, so you have to think alphabetical order, switch the order, and all that. So I won't put questions that the order is messed up, but there'll be plenty of times where you're missing a term. So just be aware, missing terms happen quite a bit, and just make sure you put your zero in the right spot. All right, so that is our correspondence. <clears throat> so now we're gonna do is look at uh, special uh, types of matrices that correspond to a very easy system of equations. And in the book, that's types of solutions. So we're going to jump to uh, 1.4 right now. So let's take the best case scenario. Let's say your matrix is 1, 0, 0, go B1, 0, 1, 0, B2, 0, 0, 1, B3. So I want you to write down what three equations this corresponds to. And you can use the variables x, y, z, or you can go x1, x2, x3, but I'm going to go x, y, z here. So our system is x is b1, y is b2, and z is b3. It's a pretty good system. Easy to understand. So this is what we call a single solution or a single point solution. And it's called that because our solution is the point b1, b2, b3. If you read as a point, x, y, z equals b1, b2, b3. So that's our best case system. Now when we start talking about other system, uh, other solutions to these systems, I want to talk about systems more broadly before we worry about their solutions. So let's talk about one single linear equation and what that does. So who's taking calculus three? Okay, so most of you have an excellent. So only a few of you know what a single linear equation in Rn, what the solution looks like. So if we're in R3, a linear equation defines a plane. Uh, generally, a single linear equation in Rn has solution of n minus 1 dimensions. And is a linear object. Technically, it's called a hypercube. So 
So let's go to R3. So a linear equation. Defines a linear object of how many dimensions? Two. So it'll be a two. So you're basically dropping a dimension when you're talking about the solution of an equation. So it's of two dimensions. What is the linear object that we think of that has two dimensions? Don't say a line. It's one dimension. Plane. Plane's got two dimensions, so we get a plane. All right, so if we are in three dimensions and we have one linear <laughs> equation, it takes us down to two dimensions, and that linear object in two, in two dimensions is always going to be a plane. Now let's drop way down to R2. Finds a linear object of how many dimensions? One. So this will be one dimension. What is this one dimensional linear object called? Line. It's a line. All right, so that's what you're used to. Right there, if you think of a linear equation, you're thinking about a line if it's in two dimensions. Uh, so all those linear equations we wrote down yesterday with just x and y, those all define lines. It might be horizontal, might be vertical, might be somewhere in between. All right, let's go to four dimensions. So how many dimensions is our uh, solution, or this linear object, if we're starting in four dimensions? So this can be three dimensions. So what is a linear object in three dimensions? Well, it's if you think of an infinitely wide plane that's two dimensions, it'll be an infinitely big cube. But it's in four dimensions, so you can't visualize that. Well, you can sort of do it if you think about time, changing over time, and that cube kind of exists at one point in time. Uh, but it gets very difficult to think in higher dimensions. Uh, so we just call all these linear objects hypercubes after three. We run out of names. So I think this one would be a cube, but I'm just going to call it a hypercube. Actually, you know what? They call it, they'll call it a three plane is what the, the word is. So when your object are three dimensions, the two planes, the plane you're thinking of, the four plane would be a, something we can't really think of, but a four dimensional linear object. All right, now what we're gonna do is think about two linear equations happening at the same time. And we wanna solve two equations, we need to satisfy both of the equations simultaneously, which is the same as intersecting the objects I'm describing. So let's go back to two dimensions first. So we're now going to look at multiple uh, linear equations. And their common solution. So we're going to go back to good old R2 days. So each linear equation defines a line. And what we want to do is think about how these lines can intersect. So we can start drawing pictures. I think there's only three cases here. So I'm just doing three little pieces of graph paper here. Uh, 
Uh, we could have the one most people think of is where they intersect in one point right there. So slopes are not the same. What are the other possibilities? So same line, we'll just make a line and just go over it a couple times so it looks extra bold. So we got same line. And what's another possibility? Parallel. Parallel. So same slope, but have no point in common. All right, so we got intersect in one point. So it intersects in one point. Uh, our solution is going to look just like x, y equals some numbers. I think I was using b's before, so we'll just go, it'll be x is the first number, y is that second number. Uh, we did an example where they did intersect in one point. Uh, same line, well, the solution is actually a line. So I'm writing down here, these are a solution. So we either get a point, um, a line, and the line is actually, you can use either of the original lines to describe this. So if they're the same line, it doesn't matter which one you use, they're the same line. So you can describe uh, with either line. What about parallel? What do those lines have in common? Well, yeah, but in terms of what, do they have any points in common? No. no. So there's nothing, uh, no intersection here. So there's no intersection. So we get no solution. There are no points that are on one line that are also on the other line. All right, so these are all situations you've probably seen before in solving systems. So we're not going to go through uh, more detail on this, but we're going to increase the dimension up to three now. So in R3, each linear equation defines a plane. Now, when we start to draw these situations, it becomes a lot more difficult because we're not in two dimensions, so we have to get a little artistic. So here we go. I'm gonna take a side view on this first one. I'm drawing these as lines, but what we're doing is looking, uh, it's the right way to think of this. I'm really bad at drawing. I'll draw with the green marker. Don't draw what I'm drawing with the green marker. But basically the planes are going back like this. So you're kind of looking at the front of them and they're going directly parallel with how you're looking. So is there a point in common? Just think of those planes going infinitely far back. Is there a single point that's on all three planes? Nope. So any point, there's po plenty of points on two of the three, but none of those points on two planes are on the third plane. So any point that would be up here would not touch that last plane down there. So this would be no solution. Uh, this does arise from three planes that are not parallel. However, you can have three planes that are not parallel that still intersect. If you just take one of the planes, so for example, this, let's see, if I take this plane, I'll do this in the next picture, and slide it over to here, we can intersect in not nothing. And we'll do, look at that one next. So we could have a very similar situation, except now we have two planes and they don't even have to be parallel they can it can look like this like an asterisk so now we have three planes and these three will be intersecting 
uh, <coughs> if the normals or the slopes of these planes are just right, they could intersect in a line. So these planes could intersect in a line. Uh, to draw intersecting in a point, I'm going to switch to three-dimensional drawing. So that was a side view. Now we'll have a 3D view. All right, how to draw this well. So I have one plane like this. Another plane intersecting like that. So just making a big plus sign right there. And then the third plane is going to be we can put it at the front or the back here. I'll just draw it on the front right here. So a third plane, basically it's like dead end right into the front there. So in this case, uh, you would have that single point on all three planes. Two planes, if you just look at two planes, they'd intersect in a line, but all three planes, in this case, they would intersect in a point. All right, so we could get no solution, we could get a line, we could get a point. Uh, we could also have all three planes or all the planes being the same plane and you could actually get a plane as well. So that could be drawn. I'll just draw a plane and I'll do my best to kind of indicate there's some parallel planes right here. So if you're, you have the same plane, the intersection is a plane. So if we count dimensions here, I'll write dimensions in green. Dimension, the first one's not applicable, doesn't have a dimension. Uh, what about a intersect in a line? How many dimensions do we have here in our solution? So, well, but the actual intersection. So we have, we have an intersection of the line, so we have a one dimensional intersection here. Now, a point is kind of silly. Talk about dimension, but if you're at a point, how many directions can you travel? Zero. Can't go any direction. So this will be a zero, dimension zero. That's why I use not applicable for no solution, because you can't go, you're not even there. So it doesn't make sense to ask how many directions can you travel. And of course, a plane would be dimension two. All right, how do we go from these pictures back to uh, that nice matrix. So we want to see it. what matrix would look like what picture. So let me go back up here for a second. Think about this system right here. X equals B1, Y equals B2, Z equals B3. That would be the point right there. So it would look like the third case right there where they're touching at one point. Still in, yeah. So free variables is going to be an important idea. So if you have no free variables, you have dimension zero. One free variable is basically you can move one direction, so that'd be dimension one. Two free variables, you would get dimension two. And etc. I'll just say n free variables, you would get dimension n. So 
but let's we saw what uh, no free variables look like. Actually, let's start with no solution. You should actually be very happy when you get no solution because it's uh, way less work for that problem. So no, no solution, also known as inconsistent. All right, what will that look like in a matrix? You actually only need one row to detect no solution. So think about just the first row of this equation where your constant's not zero. So what would the uh, equation that is represented in row one, what equation do we have? Zero equals, zero equals that B1. So what happens if you got zero, let's say B1 was seven. Let me I'll just put in the number seven instead of B1. Of course, 7 doesn't equal 0. Don't need to write that. All right, 0 equals 7. What do you say to that equation? So it's, not, it's false. You can't satisfy this equation. Doesn't matter what x is, y is, z. Doesn't matter. 0 is not equal to 7. So right there, that single line, that single equation tells you no solution. solution, the way to think of it, there are no x, y, z, there are no variables that turn 0 into 7. There's no variables in this equation. Now it's very different if you had, you know, 3x equals 7, that's totally fine. There's plenty of, you know, if you have something that's not 0 on one side, it's a variable in it, you can make that equal whatever number. All right, so that's what no solution is going to look like. And it's detected by one row. So you get zeros followed by non-zero. All right, so that is the fast case out of the way. Now we're going to look at uh, the other possibilities. So if we got one point solution, this is kind of our uh, best case scenario. Every example problem we've done so far, all two or three of them have come out to a single point. So one point, what that's going to look like, you're going to have ones down the diagonal, like that. B1, B2, B3. Now, you could write these six zeros in here that fill it up, or you can be lazy and represent that with big zeros that basically say everything I didn't fill in is a zero. So the big zero just says fill that out with zeros. Kind of like Minesweeper, and you click the thing, it opens up all that. Um, but that's how we represent zero off of the diagonal. So it could look like that. What about this matrix? I will fill in all the zeros on this guy. What is the last equation? The row four, what equation is that? Zero, zero. zero equals zero. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter, x, y, z, anything else. So Basically, what that means is that last equations give you any information. So it doesn't hurt, doesn't help. So these are the solution would be exactly the same. You're just adding in another equation that's always true. Uh, likewise, you could but I have another row of zeros. It's not going to mess anything up. So as many additional rows of zeros that won't hurt anything. Uh, let's look at. Uh, let's just go to five dimensions real quick. In R5, the equivalent matrix, there need to be five ones down there. Definitely don't want to fill the zeros in on this guy. That would take a really long time. And then you 
would have B1, B2, B3, B4, B5. So that would just be your five values for the different variables. And that would be your single uh, one point solution. All right, so that's how uh, one point looks. A good way to detect these, think about walking down a ladder right here. Not a ladder, that's a staircase. Um, if you can make it to the ground, then, uh, well, make it to the ground. That's, we don't make it to the ground, but that one's okay. If you have no stairs missing, you're okay. Uh, another way to think about it, if you're in three dimensions and you have these three ones that lock it down, then you're okay as well. So it's all about basically your dimension compared to how many uh, variables are defined at the end. So now we're going to look at what one uh, free variable looks like. This will be one free variable. So the matrix I just wrote down really doesn't have anything to do with that last row. The last row is all zeros, so it's not really relevant to the solution. But what, there's a fundamental difference between what I just, the matrix I just wrote and all the ones above. And I'll even circle in the same pattern I did before. So what's happening with the Z coordinate, or maybe what's not happening? So there's no, there's basically nothing locking down your third coordinate right here. So in that case, the fact there's nothing locking that down, in this case, Z is free. Because there's not a one right there locking it down. So that's what it means to have a free variable when it comes to looking at a matrix. You can also have X or Y free. That's totally fine as well. So in this case, you would have Y and Z locked down, but there's no, I don't know if I should circle down at the bottom or up at the top, but either way, there's nothing in the first column locking down uh, the X variable. Uh, it's pretty easy to write down a matrix where Y is free, you just spread the ones apart, so there's a one, zero, and that does not need to be zero there. So we'll go one, two, zero, zero. Now we have X is definitely locked down. Now the question is, is Y or Z locked down? Actually, it doesn't matter. So you can say whichever one you want is free. You actually will get a choice. Um, it turns out when you write your final solution, it will uh, look the same either way. So you can choose which one is free. I generally choose the furthest one to the right to be free. So I would choose Z to be free and not Y. So normally I would say, all right, that one's locked down and then Z would be free. All right, what about two free variables? So if I stay in three dimensions, 
I can really only have one row. So our x is locked down, and in this case, there's no way to lock down y and z. So in this case, I would have two free variables. I, I could equivalently lock down any of the, I could lock down any of them and then have the other two free. Uh, but again, I just almost always choose the furthest ones to the right to be free when I have a choice. Um, so here, y and z are free. Um, we will work through what these solutions actually look like uh, with real examples. And you'll see that at the end, it doesn't really matter which one you say is free because you're going to use a temporary variable for whichever one is free. And then that variable will show up in an equivalent way, no matter what choice you make. So that would be two free variables, uh, three free variables. Well, in three dimensions, if you have three free variables, your solution is the entire three dimensions you're working in. So the only equation that would whose solution would be the entire space is like zero equals zero, or five equals five. That would be the only linear, solu linear equation whose uh, solution is the entire space. So if I wrote that down, it would look like that right there. So if we go to four dimensions, however, in four dimensions, I can have a three-dimensional uh, solution, and it would look similar to this, just one equation. All right, so let's go ahead and write out what these solutions can actually look like. So let's do a one, one free variable. So I picked these so I'd already have that one lined up in the matrix. So the first thing we're going to do is write the matrix out. This matrix is 1, negative 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, negative 1, 2. Oh, I need to show you how to do row operations. Hmm. Alright, we'll need a little more algebra skills before you do this. So let's jump to reduced row echelon form. Alright, so we'll come back to this example. But let's we need a little more skills for uh, how to manipulate these matrices first. So there's a couple different names for slightly different forms that are all almost identical. Let's just go with so we'll call row echelon form so this has all zeros in the lower left triangle. So with that, and this is just row echelon form. So if you have your matrix, what that means is down, and usually you won't have it right at the, the first element. It'll be A11. But down below, everything in that triangle will all be zeros. So if you think of that diagonal going down, everything below and left is all zeros. So it would be all zeros down there. That's row echelon form. And then reduced So this would be the reduced is the difference between this and the previous form.
this will have zeros off the diagonal. So your diagonal goes down like that, and then you're going to have a big triangle of zeros below, and another triangle of zeros up to the right. I'm just going to drop a vertical bar down to signify the constants that will be over there. So the constants are kind of separate from this row echelon form. So they're treated a little differently. So these are the two main types of forms. This is basically your goal is to get it. I like to go all the way to reduced. Some people stop at row echelon form and then back substitute. But I like to do everything inside of a matrix and then just write the answer at the very end. But if you uh, enjoy substituting a little more, you can stop at row echelon form. Basically what that'll give you is your last variable, you'll know its value, and you can figure that. Use that to figure out the second to last variable, then use those two values to get the third to the last, and work up that way. You probably did, you probably did that when you did elimination. You found x or y, and then plugged that in to get y or x. So you've done that before. Uh, it just wasn't done in this form, so you didn't realize it. Whereas reduced row echelon, you're basically going to use uh, elimination to completely eliminate all the variables in one equation. All right, now how in the world do we take a matrix and turn it into this reduced uh, or the row echelon form? So there's going to be three operations we uh, are going to use, and they're called row operations. first one and I'm going to write them in the most commonly used one. So you're going to add a multiple of one row to another. Now remember one a row counts as an equation. So what we're the equivalent thing we're saying is we're going to add a multiple of one equation to another equation. That's the elimination that we did yesterday. I think we had, I multiplied one of them by two and the other one by three and it eliminated. So that's, that's the operation that we're going to do, but we're gonna do inside a matrix instead of two equations. Uh, the second operation, uh, you can swap two rows. So you can just take row two and row three and then they become row three and row two. So you just swap two rows which is the same thing as reordering your equations. So you're just gonna take your equations, write them in a different order. So in some sense, that's the easiest thing to think about. It doesn't matter which equation you wrote first, second, third, so of course you can change the order. And last, you can multiply one row by any non-zero number. So it's important you don't multiply an equation by, or a row by zero. What would you get if you uh, had some easy equation, let's say x equals three, looks like a fine linear equation. What would this equation be if I multiplied it by zero? Zero equals zero. Zero equals zero. Does that communicate the same information? No, x could be anything it wants now. So that's why you can't multiply by zero. It'd be the equivalent of deleting the entire equation. Uh, you'll see a lot of times in the first one, they say uh, non-zero multiple of one row to another. But if you want to multiply a row by zero and add it to another row, I'm not going to stop you. It is not going to progress anywhere. So it's useless, but you shouldn't multiply a row by zero and then add it to another row. Because you might as well just take a nap for 10 seconds instead of do that. All right, so this is a good place to end. We're going to do some row operations uh, tomorrow. And I want to warn you that row operations, everything we're learning now, pretty much every single topic we cover is going to come down to a problem just like the ones we're going to be solving tomorrow and the next day. So everything is going to come down to row operations, solving a matrix, and all that.